is the historic range, and they've really shrunk down to just some key areas now, um, where we know that they were existing as of 2007. Um, so, drilling down one more time into Grasses National Park, specifically, the um, green bars are the west block, blue bars are the east block counts, um, of again, number of males that went in the springtime, and you can again just clearly see that steady decline of birds uh, to neglects, and probably indicating a steady decline in the overall population of sage grouse. Uh, just to note, 2013, we just didn't have counts in the East Block that year, so that's why there's no blue bar there. Um, interestingly, the um, East Block population fluctuates a little bit more. There's a lot of evidence that that population is actually connected to the Montana population, so we can get birds coming in from Montana as long as the Montana populations are healthy. Um, we were just, a bunch of us were just at a conference last week and it sounds like the Montana populations are relatively healthy. They have, the number that the speaker gave was 44,000 birds in Montana. And we've got 16 males in Seattle. So, this is a big difference. Um, and so hopefully they'll start sending some of the birds our way. So the West Block, we don't think is connected to Montana, unfortunately. Um, we've got some evidence to show this. So um, we can do genetic testing on bird droppings. So we've had our staff go out and collect bird droppings from the lex after the birds have left for the day. And then we send that away to the lab. And we can basically look at um, how many different males were there, um, see if there's new males from one year to the next, um, and then also have an assessment of just genetic variability overall. Um, so in 2018 at our West Block LEC, we detected four males through that genetic sampling and one female, um, which is problematic because the females were the ones that raise the chicks and get that population growing again. Um, and then in 2019, we detected just two males and both were returning from the previous year. That doesn't mean there's only two males, we, can, we counted more visually, this is just kind of a confirmation that um, we're seeing four males, are they four different males every time, are they four new males every time, so this just kind of confirms that it's the same males coming to that lake in the springtime um, each time we go out and survey. Um, so, now I've told you all about the threats, the showing you the graphs on that declining population, so what does that mean in terms of protection of the species? Um, the first step that a species in Canada goes through in the listing process is they are evaluated by what's called COSIWIC. It's the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Um, they're arm's length to the federal government. Um, they basically adv advise the Minister of Environment um, on these uh, wildlife species that might be threatened or endangered or requiring special attention. Um, and so they did their first analysis of sage grouse in 1998, I believe, um, and they recommended, I think they initially recommended threatened, and then the year after that they reevaluated and said, no, we think this bird needs to be listed as endangered. Um, so at that time, the Species at Risk Act didn't even exist, actually. Um, so it wasn't until 2003 that the um, sage grouse was officially listed under Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act. Um, and what that meant basically was that there were some prohibitions to offer some additional protections to that bird. Um, basically no harming individuals, um, no damage or destruction of residences, and um, no destruction of critical habitat. And just a side note that the bird is also listed endangered provincially. Um, and that listing, I don't know the exact year, it was sometime in the late 1990s. Um, so once we get a listing, then the next step is to evaluate, again, the populations, describe um, what threats that bird is facing across its range, and basically decide is recovery feasible for that species. Um, and so with this um, recovery strategy, it was determined that yes, we think with concerted effort, we can recover greater sage grouse. Um, 
the uh, recovery strategy comes with what's called population and distribution objectives. Those basically lay out kind of the vision of where we think a stable population might be. Um, so the long-term goal is to have, in Saskatchewan, is to have at least 1,500 adults age girls and 20 or more active LECs. Um, so that's kind of the goal, long-term, but there's kind of a consensus right now that our primary goal is to stop the decline because I've showed you the graphs. It's not pretty. There aren't very many birds left in Saskatchewan, so we really need to take some concerted efforts to start helping that bird recover. So, once you get your recovery strategy, the next step uh, is to have an action plan. Um, for Grassland National Park, it's our multi-species action plan. We have covered, um, I don't know the exact number of species in the action plan, but basically a multi-species action plan basically says there's a suite of species, a lot of them are facing kind of similar threats, so we can look at them kind of as a group, um, do certain things for certain species, other things for other species, but we need to look at the whole. Um, and so we use that as a guide, it basically lays out what actions we can undertake to help that species recover. And just to note that there is also an action plan for the South Hill Divide area. So I had that map earlier where I showed the compounding of threats, the South of the Divide was that blue area. Basically, the south of the continental divide. So, uh, and then there's even further protection afforded to sage grouse. Um, the federal government basically looked at the populations uh, again and the threats facing them and decided there were imminent threats to their survival and recovery of the species, and that without increased protection and additional conservation actions, the sage grouse was likely to be extirpated within five years of the EPO. Um, it was put in place in 2014. We're now beyond five years out, so we haven't lost a species yet, so that's good news. Um, but their population is so crazy low, again, um, that any extra effort that we can put into bringing that species back is really required right now. Um, so just to give you a visual of that EPO, thinking that this is the population of Saskatchewan, they aren't anywhere except Grasslands National Park. I mentioned a hailstorm. If a hailstorm happened to come through here instead of up here where it came, that whole population could have been wiped out. Um, so basically any little event could cause the population to just be gone from Saskatchewan. So that's what we're working against. Um, I've already showed you this. So again, step number one, stop the decline. So these are the things that Grasslands National Park is working really hard on to make sure that sage grouse have opportunities to breed and nest and successfully raise chicks to get those chicks into the breeding population the next year. Um, so we've done some analysis, especially in the West Block, to figure out um, where there might be really important things that we can do to restore the functional habitat for sage grouse. Um, so there might be sage brush, there might be forbs on the ground, um, there might be suitable nesting sites, but if those sites are impacted by things like power poles or old yard sites that are attracting predators, um, those are detrimental to that bird being able to successfully breed. So we've basically done an analysis that says anything in purple has been impacted by something happening on the landscape. So um, roads, power poles, fence lines, and so um, those are kind of the areas we need to target to improve the habitat for sage grouse. So with this particular project, we're going to be focusing on things like outbuildings. Um, the park is a big place. We've acquired a lot of um, old ranch buildings um, that host predators. They provide a perching opportunity for those avian predators. Um, we're going to be strategically looking at removing those ones that are no longer needed um, and don't have a value for visitors. Um, and then also looking at our, our fencing program. Um, we've done quite a bit of work already because um, staff at the park, before I got there, had great insights about what might be negatively impacting sage grouse. So starting in about 2016, 
Um, they started this really concerted effort for fence marking and removal. Um, they marked 40 kilometers of fence. Basically, they put these clips on, which allows sage grouse to see those fences easier, so they're less likely to fly into that fence um, and kill themselves, basically. Um, we've also removed 56 kilometers of fencing, and, and we're looking at um, where can we remove more fence, where do we need to mark fence, and trying to be really strategic about it in terms of where it is in relation to known um, nesting sites or the leks, um, and that way we can get the biggest bang for our buck, basically. Um, because we are a park, we do have a lot of signs. We need to tell visitors where to go, where not to go, um, interpret things, uh, put up interpretive signs and tell them about the landscape. Um, but then again, those signs can provide perching opportunities for those eating predators. So we're working on um, a program to kind of evaluate perches to see which ones are the most effective. Um, this great horned owl is happily sitting on a perch. Deterrent. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> clearly that perch deterrent is maybe not the most effective. Um, so we're continuing to evaluate other other perch deterrents because um, we need those signs. We're not going to take them down. So we need to have some other way of mitigating that impact. So perch deterrents are probably the best option. Um, so we've had a lot of staff working on this one. They've got cameras out, testing different perch deterrents, um, looking at the data, trying to figure out what is the most effective. Um, we've also got this kind of stopgap measure, population augmentation. Um, this is happening in the West Block. Uh, we've got a great partnership with the Calgary Zoo. They were able to start a captive breeding population with um, eggs collected from Grasslands National Park and hens that were translocated from Montana. Excuse me. Um, so they have this captive population at the Calgary Zoo, and the hens are able to breed there. They can hatch their chicks out, and then those birds become available for release into the park. Um, and potentially other sites. There's also a release site in Alberta that um, Calories was working with there. Um, so our goals with this population augmentation is to buy time. Maybe some of those females might get into that breeding population um, in the West Block and go mate with a male that's already there. Make some chicks, grow our population a little bit. Um, so we're really just buying time with this strategy. Um, Potentially, if it works really well, we could reactivate inactive legs. So um, that's one of the goals of the recovery strategy is we've got just one left in grass in National Park, but we might, our long-term goal would be to have five or six lefts, maybe more than that. Um, so if, if this population augmentation is really successful, um, then we can maybe re reactivate an inactive leg. Um, and also, these birds are being tracked. They've got collars on. Um, and we've, the staff from the Calgary Zoo are tracking these birds so that information can help us understand where we might do some targeted habitat management or restoration efforts. Um, so this, this program is really important um, and we're really hopeful that it's going to help buy us time for some of the long-term things that we're looking at doing. Um, so I wanted to show you a video. Hopefully the computer won't freeze and we'll have to switch back to the other one. Um, this one's just on my thumb drive. This is the uh, release of stage girls from their pen in um, just this past fall. So you'll see that it's not very exciting, which is good. <laughs> These are the birds here. The gate kind of has been opened up. They're just kind of hanging out, not really sure what to do. But um, there's a pen keeper in there kind of cleaning up, getting ready for the next batch of birds. And they're still just kind of wandering around, not really sure what's going on. Going the wrong direction even. It's very windy this day, so the, I don't know if you can hear, there's like a clicking noise, that's just one of the straps for the uh, pen being held down, blowing in the wind. So we keep them in these pens uh, for 
couple of weeks to get them kind of acclimated to their new landscape. Um, they can kind of get used to the sights and the sounds of being out in wild nature instead of in a um, captive breeding facility at the Calgary Zoo. Um, and they get fed in there. Um, yeah, and so now you can start to see a couple of them are kind of wandering out. This is what we like to see. We don't want these birds to just flush out and then immediately fly into a fence or something. So walking out slowly is good. Now most of them are out. It's not very exciting. <laughs> it's, it's exciting from a conservation perspective, but maybe not from a viewing it perspective.
We have started um, kind of a pilot program looking at hayfield restoration. Grasslands National Park has done a lot of restoration. We've just never done one in a hayfield in the Frenchman River Valley that could potentially flood. We've done mostly upland restorations up to this point. So this restoration program is posing some new challenges um, that we haven't really dealt with before. Uh, we're pretty excited to get started on it um, and see how it goes. It's going to take a few years to get any sort of results. It takes a long time for us to collect the native seed that we need to put into the um, hay field to get that native um, community reestablished. Um, and we're also looking at enhancements. So going out and um, actually planting sage plugs in areas that have low sagebrush density that could probably support higher density of sagebrush. So just to give you an idea, this is kind of one example of a hay field in that Frenchman River Valley. Um, it's really dense, smooth grown grass. In the Larson block of the West Block, it hasn't been hayed for a really long time, so it's just kind of matted and not a very healthy ecosystem. Um, in other areas of the West Block, the hay fields are actively used for creating winter feed for cows. Um, so those areas, uh, once they're no longer needed for beef production uh, purposes, they might be uh, more suitable even for restoration because they have been actively hayed for a long time. Um, this is kind of what we want to restore it to look like. You can imagine that's going to take a lot of years. Um, because it takes a sagebrush plant just alone to grow that big. Maybe it takes 30 years to grow that big. Um, so that will be kind of our goal. It's long term. Again, <laughs> I've got in the front row the, my colleague that's actually kind of leading the restoration program for this project. So she's kind of making faces at me. <laughs> <laughs> really doing it. Yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> um, another thing that we're working on it for long term gains is grazing management. Um, we're trying to work from going from more permitted grazing to more collaborative grazing. So our grazing programs in the past have been largely permitted where we give a rancher a certain number of AUMs, you put them in on this day, take them out on this day, um, you deal with the cows in between. Um, we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to work more collaboratively with our um, ranching partners so that they can kind of tell us what's going on in the landscape. We can tell them kind of the habitat attributes that we're after, and we can work together to make grazing plans that are more suitable for stage growth. Um, they might also be able to tell us things like, you know, I don't really need that fence. You could take that fence out. Um, that dugout over there needs to be cleaned so that my cattle will actually graze in that area. Um, so we can really have strong partnerships with the people who are grazing in the park. They can offer a lot of um, help in us managing that land for um, species at risk and sage grouse in particular. Um, we're also looking at fire as a management tool. Um, first, it could be useful in those uh, hay field restoration projects that we're just starting. They can get rid of that thick, dead mat of grass and kind of open it up and allow, our, allow us to get our machinery in there um, and not destroy it on a rock or a tree that's hidden in the grass. Um, it, we can also use it in native prairie. Um, so one of the concerns that our um, Grasslands National Park staff had uh, was that fire would kill the sagebrush and it would never come back. Um, that has been a problem in the United States where um, downy brome, which is also called cheatgrass, and wildfires have kind of um, shifted the whole ecosystem in favor of that cheatgrass species so that sagebrush is no longer growing. Um, the species of sagebrush down there don't respond well to the fire. Um, but silver sagebrush, there was some limited evidence that it actually resprouts really vigorously after fire. So we started a research project in the east block of the park to look at this question and get some information about how sagebrush actually does respond to fire. And our preliminary results from that research are showing that yes, sagebrush does actually re-sprout um, quite vigorously um, after fires. Um, and the other nice thing about fires sometimes is that after a prescribed fire, you can get something that looks like this, which again is really important 
for those seed trout chicks. Um, that provides great habitat for insects, and that's what those chicks need their first week or so after hatching. So um, we can use fire across the landscape to kind of get that those different types of habitats going that sage grouse need. Um, another thing that's a kind of a long-term program ongoing is invasive plant management. Um, leafy spurge is one that we're really targeting. Um, if that gets away on you, it can be hugely detrimental both to the value of that area for wildlife habitat, but also for grazing. Cows don't like leafy spurge, and some of you have probably seen some areas around here that have been completely taken over by leafy spurge, and they're just not not productive grasslands anymore. So we're targeting that one really heavily. Um, we're also working, we do have downy grown that cheat grass on some of our trails in the park. So we're working on control programs for downy brome to make sure that that plant doesn't alter our fire cycles like it has in the United States. Um, so those are really important, two really important programs for sage grouse. Um, looking forward, there's some other things we want to explore um, that we haven't quite gotten to yet. So there's this new technology called virtual fencing. Basically, the livestock wear collars. They all wear a collar. And then on your smartphone, you can set a boundary. And it, <laughs> it transmits that boundary to the collars. Um, and basically, there's a training algorithm in the collar that starts with a beep and then gets maybe a louder beep and then a zap and then maybe a really big zap to train the cows to stay in that fenced area and to respond just to that beep so they know, okay, I can't go that direction, I've got to turn around. Um, so that's a, a technology that we would like to explore. There is a pilot project in northern Montana um, with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance um, on a ranch and from what I've heard, he's getting good results from it. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to kind of explore that hopefully soon at the park. Um, and that sort of is the technology that would allow us to get rid of fences in the park, which would be really helpful for a lot of our different wildlife species. <clears throat> um, the other thing that we're looking at strategically is water. Um, so water is obviously crucial for grazing management and it can be used to influence livestock distribution. So if we can find a way to get water to areas of the park that don't have water, but maybe not digging a dugout, um, that would be a great tool for us to influence where the livestock are going and targeting certain areas um, for grazing. And another thing that we're looking at expanding, um, just kind of in the early conceptual phase, is this grass bank concept. So there's a really cool uh, grass bank in northern Montana with the Nature Conservancy. They've got, I think, 14 or 18 ranching ranchers who are their partners. Um, they get access to land that the Nature Conservancy owns, um, and they get reduced fees on that land in exchange for doing conservation actions on their privately owned land. Um, and each action has basically a different uh, fee rebate um, so if they do multiple things, they can get up to a 50%. Um, their bill could get cut in half, basically, um, for doing certain conservation actions on their land. Um, so we're looking at this and trying to figure out how we might be able to apply a similar model. Grasslands National Park has a lot of land. We need people in there grazing. Um, how can we use that to then encourage conservation actions outside of the park? <coughs> um, which is important when the population of sage grouse starts to grow because they obviously don't know where the park starts and ends. Um, and even the ones we have right now, they might leave the park. And I think the ones that we've released have left the park. So it's important that we're working with these partners um, to make sure that there's a larger ecosystem outside of just the park that can support sage grouse. Um, another issue is kind of a question mark. I was reading through the recovery strategies and the action plans and the original Kosiwik assessments for sage grouse. Um, one of them said, we, don't, we know that conversion happened, but it's not really continuing to happen, so we're not thinking that that's a threat. But um, 
I think we all know that it is continuing to happen. One of my colleagues says there's just continuous nibbling. Little patches of native prairie get converted here and there. Uh, but when we've only got 15% left in Saskatchewan, every little bit counts. Um, so there's, it, it becomes really important to make sure that ranchers can stay on the land. Um, there's a lot of changing economic forces, uh, social forces, succession. The, I don't know what the exact statistics are, but I'm sure you've all heard that the age of the agricultural population is, I, I think it's, yeah, I'm not going to get the statistics right, but basically there's going to be a big group of farmers and ranchers who are coming into retirement and they don't necessarily have succession plans in place. So that could be potentially problematic for native grass. Um, and technologies have improved. Uh, there's new uh, plant varieties that can survive our drought conditions, uh, new farming technologies that maybe allow land that didn't used to be considered suitable for farming to now be farmed and farmed quite rapidly. So um, there's a lot of people kind of looking, looking at this. Grasslands National Park is interested in it from the perspective that we don't want to be an island. If we lose all of the native prairie around Grasslands National Park, then there's no chance basically of recovering the sage grouse or any of the other species at risk in the park. Um, luckily, there are a lot of people working on native grasslands, both on um, conserving prairie, conserving species at risk, working with ranchers to make sure that they have viable incomes. This is just a really um, brief look at there, there's definitely other people working on these things as well. Um, these are just some of the few that I'm a little bit familiar with. Um, so basically, we're working towards recovery. We're doing all these things to try to ensure that we can get this little chunk carved out that's really suitable for sage girls. They're not facing those threats anymore. And then hopefully, I hope someday, um, we'll get back to where sage girls are occurring across the south of the divide. Um, and they can maybe someday even be um, listed as threatened or maybe come off the endangered species of risk altogether. That's a long ways down the road, 